Well, that's me on the coast of the Indian Ocean in Tanzania. And I'm told, actually, that it was Christmas of my fifth year. And what did I want to be at that point in time in my life? Well, I wanted to work with everything wild, whether it was plants or animals and all the way up to elephants. And I wanted to work with people, whether they were Africans or whether they were Asians or whether they were Americans or Brits. And in a way, I'm the luckiest person in the world because I became what I wanted when I was five years old. So that's the history of, of me. But I'm told these days that I'm referred to as a tri-sector leader. It's a pretty frightening thing. Like, what is that? Well, a tri-sector leader has all these different characteristics. But some of them are that you've worked in the academic world, in the NGO world, in the intergovernmental world. You've been a politician. And you worked in the private sector. And then somehow you become this multiplicity of people. But mostly what I've been is something a bit out of the box. So I'm never what anyone really thinks. So at one point in time, not too long ago, maybe five or six years ago, I was contacted by a gentleman by the name of Jochen Zeitz, who was at the time the CEO of the company Puma. And Jochen used a number of different ways to get through to me, and then we had a conversation. And now that I know him well, I know that must have been a tough conversation for him. Cold call. Just calling someone up and saying, I want to talk to you because I'm looking for someone that's an out-of-the-box thinker, that does different things, that doesn't, is not ruled by any particular rules and laws and anything else, but just thinks thoughts. My God, I mean, it was like, uh, I think you might have the wrong number. My name's Holly Dublin. Uh, no, no. I said, well, I think you might because I've caused some problems in some organizations and I haven't really been a great fit. No, no, I'm after you. So that started a relationship that's still going on. And what he asked me as time went on, there were many things, but one of the things was I want to do something really big. I want to do something big in the field of sustainability. So what are we going to do? What will be our really cool idea of the thing that we're going to do together? So what he asked me to do was to join the company that was the holding company of Puma. And that company was then called PPR. It's now called Caring. And you heard a bit about it in the introduction. So I was asked to start a sustainability initiative there. And my very first thing, because I am tra trained as a scientist, my very first thought was, OK, well, before I bi build a big strategy and I set targets and make people really upset with me, what are the baselines? You know, where, where does the company stand? Because I don't want to make someone yeah, I mean, do something, and they say, where do you must come from? from? We already do that, or we could never do it. Well, uh, well. And so I said to him, well, tell me what the baselines are, because I need those things. The baselines of what? Oh, yeah, yeah, we measure carbon. And, and in fact, we, we've built a neutral headquarters. Uh -huh. Completely unimpressed Holly. She obviously irritated him unbelievably, because this was a big thing. Big money, big expenditure. And I said, no, but I really want to know what are the impacts of this company on the environment? So if I could have the first slide, this is where our discussions began, because I had managed to convince him very well that we were going to um, be doing some measurements. But I had to tell him about something else. He was very much into all of it, so I was very lucky to have a CEO that was interested. So I showed him that little small circle, and I said, those are the sort of environmental impacts that uh, arrive somewhere in your financial statements. But here are your environmental impacts. And I don't even need to have studied anything yet, because I can tell you that big pink thing might be very, very big. So how are we going to do this? And he said, well, biodiversity, ecosystem services, all those things Johan Rockström talks about. I could never talk with the CEO, other CEOs about that. I can't talk to my procurement director about that. I need to talk to him about something. It's got to be really tangible. I, have to, I need to talk to him about It's got to be financial. I said, oh, well, I don't know. You know I'm, I've done some valuation work. And he said, I know. Let's do an environmental profit and loss account. And that was the beginning of the environmental profit and loss account. The only problem was no one had ever done one, and we didn't know how to do it. And he went to the press about two weeks later and said, we're doing one, and we're going to announce the results in just a few months' time. So this is what life is like in the fast lane when you put your head above the parapet and say, yes, yeah, sometimes I have some out-of-the-box ideas. So the environmental profit and loss account, what really was it or what really is it? It's a means of placing a monetary value on the societal costs of the environmental impacts of businesses. And that monetary value thing, as was said by some of the speakers before me, you know, this is the thing that gets business. Oh, numbers. You mean numbers that come off of our balance sheet or numbers that tell me I'm doing a good or a bad job. Yes, and guess what? Numbers that have something to do with your performance bonus in the end. 
So will you be able to reduce these very negative numbers? So we began on this exercise, and it's, it's got lots of numbers. For those of you that love metrics, you'd love this, because it has lots and lots of numbers. But this is a really important slide, because what it shows is that, first of all, they were completely convinced that their biggest impact was on greenhouse gases. And we didn't need to bother with anything else. But uh-oh, we found out that water was just as big of an impact. So there were all these eureka moments. And the green circle there shows you what their operations were. That's that little circle that was in the middle on the first slide. Oh, it turns out that their operations, either the cell phone pieces, the bits you directly are in charge of, that was only 6% of the overall impact of 145 million euros. So these numbers are, you know, I've been asked so many times, is that a real number? Is, that fi is it 145 million euros exactly? Or are there some cents? Doesn't matter, that's not the main point. So the main point is that we discovered that down, way down deep, tier four, where these real impacts take place are the places that companies need to start thinking about. But having done the EPNL within Puma as a, a pilot, more or less, been taken up by p the Caring Group, and they're now they're taking 24 companies through this. And we're being joined by companies all around the world, and I'm actually a recruiter. That's my another new my new thing. I recruit companies to do EPNLs. But we've discovered that they just have so many more values. And just to go through a couple of them, obviously helping you to manage your risk. You're going to find out about risks you didn't even know you had. About transparency and reporting. If these things, as we believe, start becoming real, we're going to have government regulation. We're seeing it in the UK. They want to know what your carbon is. You're going to be reporting on that. And you want to make sure that you're leveling that playing field between yourselves and all those other companies. So it has a lot to do with that little transparency bit. In other words, I write a big sustainability report, it's 300 pages long, and you write one, it's 20 pages long, but your marketing department has more money than mine. Yours is so cool, and mine's just a bunch of words. So we don't even know, we don't know how to compare them. But when you start doing this, you know a lot more about comparing. It also informs management action, so you can start doing something about it. You know, we've, we've lived through efficiencies. We, we're running out of what we can do with efficiencies, but there are many more things you can do through innovations. Since we began doing this, new companies have formed to help us address our problems. That is a stimulation of the economy. We're showing that innovation is what's needed in these things. I mean, I'm an ecologist, I'm an ecosystem scientist, so I don't believe for a minute that there's techno fixes for everything in the world, not for one minute. But I do believe that we can make major leaps in the right direction by moving those things. It also helps us to understand and create value. So we understand much more deeply about the products that we're producing, about where they come from, what's needed in them, and what are those true impacts that we have to put that product on the market and give it to someone. It helps us to inform strategy. I can tell you that we know that this is working because um, the companies that are doing it, when I ask them to make the business case, um, and come to, with me to bring in some more companies on my recruiting drives, they're like, well, you know, I don't think, well, I can't really, don't. So what we've discovered is they're actually getting a market advantage doing this thing. They've actually discovered how to do their business better. And they did that doing the environmental profit and loss. And I mean, would you want to go give it to your competitor company? You just learned something about how to get a market advantage. You just learned something about how, how to improve your business, how to reduce your impact. So, of course, you're not going to put it right out there. And engaging decision makers, well, we know, because we're working with policy people around the world right now. We work with decision makers. I work with, you know, people that are in the C-suites of these companies. You couldn't move one of these people on sustainability. It was not a possibility. I was a lucky person. I, you know, I reported directly to a CEO. Most sustainability directors, they report to the head of marketing. They report to the HR department. They, they have a budget of $25,000 a year. They don't exist. They don't exist. So the fact is that being able to get that C-suite involved and saying your bonuses are going to have something to do with how well you perform as a group together. The CFO. We brought, after doing the Puma EPNL, we began bringing the CFO to the table immediately. The next one, as the next one was being started up, bring the head of your supply chain, you bring your CFO, you bring your HR director. Now they suddenly start realizing, oh, we're all tied together in how we're going to do this as a business. Because if you don't su succeed, I don't succeed. And that now gets me, because it's going to get my bonus, and I don't like that. So we have to work together. So we've begun to understand a lot from this. And um, 
just to let you know, we, we started thinking, okay, we do have to work that whole value chain. We initially went just from what's called you know, cradle to gate, where you sell the product. But then we thought we have to go all the way, all the way down cradle to grave and talk about our consumers. So we went ahead and we, we did some work on the EPNL to look at the product level. This one's mine. They made me carry it all the way from Kenya. And, and this is the really cool new one that Puma made called the InCycle shoe. So we started doing comparisons of products to see whether the EPNL really held all the way to the product level. And, and in fact, what we found out, we did it on uh, 20 or 30 different products that we had. And what we found out was that in a number of cases, we could actually produce the better garment, the better shoe, the better, less heavy environmental impact piece at the same price. We could actually even market it at the same price. Now, this is a very important thing for those of you that are in business because the biggest argument against doing sustainability is it's going to cost more. Who's going to pay it? Is it going to come out of our margins? Is it going to be given to the consumer? This has become a mantra that in some ways, if we don't break out of that, we're in the situation where what you pay less for is the bad thing and what you pay more for is the good thing. What's wrong with that? Now, Lona's going to tell me that what's wrong with it is that people don't operate from that kind of logic, and, and that's probably true. But actually, what I believe is that in the end, when all things have this kind of basis to them, when absolutely every product has to have this in it, and you don't ask that question anymore. Is it a sustainable product? Is it not a sustainable product? What is it? Don't have to worry about that anymore because they all have to have it and they all will have their little tag saying whatever. So we learned a few things from, from the EPNL and um, Puma's learned them and some of the other companies. And what we've done is we've gone on to sort of build on that and just I'll end on explaining to you about a little bit about the B team. The B team isn't the A team. And that bugs Americans seriously, because the only good thing could be the A team. But we think the B team is pretty top. So it was something that um, started by Jochen Zeitz and Sir Richard Branson. And basically, it's a group of global business leaders who really, really believe. Their vision is that business should be a force for social, environmental, and economic benefit. And that they're going to start moving out these things um, with a passion, because it takes passion to do this. You have to really believe in it. And the B team has been looking at what are, those, what are those barriers in the world to getting at the things that we all believe are important. Those barriers are around leadership. Oh, uh-oh, it's not so good, you know? Like when we had to get business leaders that believe this, we really had to work hard. They're, they're not everywhere in the whole world. There are few of them. And there are even fewer of them that want to put their head up there above the parapet and say, I'm one of those people that believes that, God forbid, somebody's going to not like that, particularly maybe your shareholders might not like that too much. So it's getting around that. So we know leadership is super, super important. So we've been talking to business schools, and we've been asking them. And what we find is they're not so keen on sustainability, but the students are. The students are so keen on sustainability that they're finding professors all over the world to link up to one another outside their business school and taking online courses with those guys in the virtual world. So we're finding those individual leaders and trying to link them together in those schools. What else do we think is important? Well, the future bottom line. Uh, I was just telling you about the environmental side, so we've decided that the social side also needs to be dealt with. And we've just taken up a partnership with the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, which I know Antonio is a, a part of. I'm a wonderful, great fan of it, and I work very hard in, with colleagues of the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. We're taking it upon ourselves to work on a social profit and loss account. And we're asking businesses to join us in that and to pilot these things. Because, you know, being a first mover is not the worst thing in the world. And you're going to know that t 10 or 15 years down the line, you're going to say, I don't know what all those other companies that didn't join were thinking. Because I am right out there, and I now know where every one of my risks are. So our last bit is about incentives. Those are the ones we're working on right now. You've got to incentivize businesses. You can't whip, whip them all the time. Sometimes you have to say, what's the good thing you could get out of this? What is the positive way we could incentivize you? Oh, well, oh, governments and regulation and oh, uh, yeah, but, you know, subsidies are really perverse. That's what they're incentivized by right now. Subsidies, the ones that Johan Rockström talked about. The billions and billions that go into behaving badly. Yeah, but what if we could flip that the other way? So the billions and billions go into behaving well, and then the product costs less, and then everybody's got the same product, and then we have a level playing field. And the world has a half of a chance 
of being something that we can all live in and that the people that come after us can all live in. So that's kind of the mandate of the B team. And um, I'll be happy I'm around the rest of the day to talk to anyone about the other things we're doing in the B team, which are all very exciting. So thank you very much for having me.